So how you been since we talked a couple days ago? Yeah, um, I've got I've had a headache yesterday and today. Have you been busy? But I haven't, no purging, no purging. Yeah, because that's what we left. Uh, that's where we left off. That was my challenge for you. It was like let's simplify yeah. it. Just start by eliminating the purge, and let's face from there what comes up. So, have you been binging? No, I came that close, <laughs> and then I just suddenly realized what I was doing, and I just stopped. And what happened if you when you stopped? Uh, I felt relieved that I'd realized what I was doing and stopped it. I felt relieved. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. Did you notice the conversations going on in your mind about just go ahead and give yourself more food? You can always go and purge it. Did you hear that at all? Did you recognize that? Yeah. Loud and clear. Right. So Loud getting and clear. So can you see how that's the enabling aspect of your relationship with food? That the concept of getting rid of the physical well, the fear of gaining weight is what you're trying to get rid of. The consequence physically of actually purging is is horrible, right? You now have a, you know, 50 years, right? Is it 50 now of binging and purging and bulimia? 42. Yeah, okay, 42. Okay, okay. So 42 years of de of chronic, um, in you know, acid. You can make yourself puke without even trying. It's like you can just do it. And... um that consequence you have not cared about. What you care about is the consequence of the binging and the weight gain as a... So the actual purge, can you see that that's not your... That that part isn't the issue. The issue is the reason why you're purging, which is to get rid of the fear and the shame of weight gain that you are guaranteeing with a binge. It's so it's so not linear, right? But it is. It's linear, but it's not. Can you see that? Given my experience before I spoke to you last time, yes, I can see it. Mm -hmm. I think that's why I was feeling so confused and baffled about what was going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But you, that last session really helped. It gave me a lot a lot of clarity around it that I didn't have. Yeah. Well, and yeah. To, oh, I, I so agree. I so agree around the removal of the purge, allowing you to see a little more clearly how the actual purge promotes the binge. Oh, yeah. Totally, yeah. Right? I know. Yeah. So to me, yeah. so what that allows you to see is that the binge issues that you have, that impulsive need to get freedom to just eat your food, is promoted. It's not caused by it. It's promoted. Yeah. Because I see this as not one thing causing the next. It's a variety of things put together that promotes this response. Wouldn't you agree? Yes. Like a syndrome. Yeah. Like and a... I really get that it's not causing it, but promoting it. Correct. You got it. So, so, yeah. and 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 it's kind of it like saying it. what causes the flower to bloom. Should we say the sun causes the flower to bloom? Well, it promotes that. So does the water. So does the soil. The nutrition, right? So there is an environment that promotes that outcome. When we adjust the environment, the outcome should adjust as well. So if our goal for you is that you're, so we could say, if we know intellectually our goal is to demote this binging and purging, we have to go into the reasons why and what is why you would do it. So if we remove the purge, you immediately have this, you know, um, the, it's like the drive to binge now has, uh, it should have felt disorienting. Like, hold on, well, hold on, like, I gotta stop. 
Yeah, it's like a shout, almost like a an uh, almost audible shout in my head. Hold on. <laughs> yeah, so you, yeah. it made it obvious to you. I think that might have been what what it does when you consciously remove the purge, and it was conscious. It was something that. I just, I definitely directed you to do, not demand, but directed you to do it. And when you choose to do that, all of a sudden, there's some things that become obvious. Whereas before, because that purge was always negotiable in your mind, it kept things from being, you be, from being aware. So by completely eliminating the purge and going backwards from that route, you can see again that it's promoting, it actually is a, part of what promotes your binge eating behavior. This is um, the same with people who they don't necessarily vomit or purge through ex exercise. It's very similar to people who negotiate around dieting, right? I will restrict. So I have clients who will binge eat, but they only do it knowing and believing and imposing severe restrictions as a counter effect to create equilibrium, right? Because yeah. you've got to create balance. Can you see that's where the purge comes in? But the purge ultimately is promoting the binge because if you don't have a purge, what has happened to your binge impulsivity? Or react, you know, the actual act of binging. What has happened to it over the course of the last three days? It just completely cut it dead. I yep. just stopped it in an instant. The minute that I wasn't negotiating, no, I can be all right because I can purge. The minute that was taken away, it changes just cut it. it dead. Yeah. yeah, something I've noticed with, um, you know, bulimics too is if you get rid of the actual vomiting. The binges sometimes can continue, but they change in their quantity, the amount of food you'll be eating. So what happened for me when I committed to never purging again is I transferred it. I transferred my, you could say, defense mechanism, my shield from the fear of gaining weight. I transferred it to excessive exercise because exercise wasn't so um, – it my perception was that I couldn't eliminate everything that I was eating. My binge is significantly reduced in quantity because I had to make them manageable with exercise. Uh, Does that make I sense? Yeah, yeah, so people that puke the food up tend to have massive, we're talking massive binges because you're just going to puke it up. And then you'll keep on binging and then puke it up again, right? And then you'll you'll continue to binge. So the binge process goes on and on and on. And that's how, for me, when, I, when someone's like, well, how often did you binge? It was like, well, when I was actively purging all day long, it could, I remember the worst days. And this was when you reached out for my help. It was like 12 times a day, upwards to 15, where it was literally ruining my life. It's all I was doing was micromanaging the food, ruining my micromanagement, binging, purging, starting over, binging, purging, binging, purging for like yeah. all day long. It's intense, right? So when you remove the purge, it really, you could, you'll feel that that binge aspect of this, of this syndrome, of this promoted behavior significantly reduces. Now, did you, did it completely go away for you or are you still overeating? What are you doing in terms of like, where did it land for you? Um, only been a short time since I last spoke to you. Yeah, it's been the two days. first night was, I was eating and then I don't know what happened. I don't know if I suddenly thought, I'm trying to think. But now this is too much to eat. Never mind, I'll carry on eating and I can purge. And then I thought, oh, no. See? I'm not going to purge. Yeah, and, and when you get rid of the purge, you have to force yourself to look at, well, why am I overeating then? If there's nothing I just, to get I rid of it. I don't know. But I just, well, I just did it. I couldn't help it. I took the food out of my mouth and put it down. Mm hmm Because I thought, no, no, I'm not going to purge. I'm not going to eat it and purge. So I just, I'd, I'd eaten. I'd had plenty to eat. So you just stopped. I just stopped. 
Okay. Yeah. yeah. So for you in that moment, it was really just authentic. It's just there was no negotiation around a different way to get rid of it. So that's awesome. Some of that might have to do with the previous work we've already done. The next day, my brother came to visit. So I was eating company, so I was all right. Yeah. But today, I've been fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the other thing that might come up, too, is I want you to go into what it is, the dialogue in your mind when you're like, well, I'll just keep on overeating because I can purge. And then you were like, hold up. No, I'm not. Why would you have that conversation? Yeah, that's a bit, I don't really, well, I don't understand, yeah. Well, it's there, it's there, it's, there is, there is the reality that's in there. You need to be able to profess it or describe it, right? So, I can help you, I can do it for you. But you got to be able to go in and go, well, why would I even negotiate to purge? What's the yeah, point of purging? It must be what we talked about last time about that, like, that attachment, that clinging on to wanting to be thin. It yeah. must be. Or it, 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 be it, 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 it doesn't have to be clinging to thinness. For me, it was to remove the, in, the intense fear of gaining weight. So it can be not just I need to be thinner. It can be I can't be fatter than this. Yeah. So you're so does that make sense? Even though it's all a matter of thinner is better, the bias is always directed that way. It may not yeah. actually be I need to cling to thinness. It could be I'm yeah. clutching to not gaining weight. I am. I don't want to be exposed. It's like I don't want to be put out and in, in exposed as a fraud. Yeah, so that's very I defensive. Because uh, I have lost some weight recently, but it was by accident because I had a, a sinus infection and I think it affected my inner ear. So I had yeah. quite a long period where I was feeling nauseous a lot of the time. Yeah, and you just and I didn't feel. I completely lost my appetite. So at some point during that process, were you pretty excited about the weight loss and the thinnerness and the that feeling of starvation that you might have been experiencing? Not that it was when people started. Nobody commented after our last set of sessions a year ago. Um, I did put on weight, and no, not a single person commented on that. But as soon as I started losing the weight because of the sinus infection and the nausea and a bit of stress at work as well, people started paying me compliments and commenting on it. I think that's what got me. That's what. Yeah, you never really attach to it for yourself. You know what I mean? Like really go into your own personal. Um, that might have. I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm not. I just really want you to go down into where you became attached to it. It's that buzz of people saying, oh, you look really well. You look like you've lost some weight. Did you it not notice? Did you not notice? That I'd lost weight. Yeah, did you not personally notice in any way? Make sure you. I, I, I didn't think I really cared. Okay, I, I just want to make sure when truth. just bring I up the truth. truth. I like, was yeah. excited. I was. Okay. But yeah, I remember I was excited that I felt lighter and. Okay. See, the, this yeah. is important. You bring this truth up. Don't repress this part. Like yeah. when I'm bringing this up, it's really important you go into it and like let it out. Yeah. No, I can remember I got a buzz, and then that was. Just there you go. Keep that in and mind. Activated with the compliments. Yeah. Made so you had already, and I knew that too. I'm like, for you to have had this relapse, it's not about other people complimenting you. You had to have gotten off of it yourself. Yeah. I for did. it to I come back. Yeah. yeah. Because yeah. you can be complimented and appreciate a compliment, uh, and a, um, a compliment. But what really drives this is that inner narcissism, the inner sense of betterment within your own sense of well, well-being and your yeah. not even well-being, your own sense of success. So that's why I asked the question and your first answer was no. Yeah. So I'm going to ask the question again, really feel this out. Did you in any way, as you were not eating, did you get any gratification from the, the physiological sense of starvation? And the actual stomach going in type, ooh, I'm succeeding. Did you have any reaction to it? 
think the f- <sighs> where you liked it. There's a gratification to the sense of losing weight and knowing it is occurring and getting gratification from it. The physical, well, I didn't feel a sense of starvation. That's I okay. I bring that up because that would be something that would uh, would be someone who's lived in anorexia before. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah, it just felt nauseous. Okay, that might have ruined everything. That <laughs> yeah. But, um, you know, I just recall from my own anorexic well, time, the gratification of that feeling of being starved and that low well, energy level, it really gives you a sense of success. It's so warped. What but, I do remember, which is really, I've just um, realized, and it's re- now that I think about it, it's very, very unhealthy, was a sense of disappointment when my appetite came back, like, oh, no. <laughs> Well, at that point, you'd already been, you'd already, your mind was already in that space, right? Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. for sure, right? If you go back into that gratification of that sense of winning or success or betterment or personal gain, you're so screwed, right? Because your body is going to go back into its natural state of being and, and that in and of itself is threatening your ego. So the body, yeah. yeah, and so then, can you see then the pendulum begins? Because now you have to restrict and try to keep and maintain, and then your likelihood of breaking your own rules is what? Pretty high. Yeah. Massive. Highly likely. So statistically, your likelihood of binging after you start restricting to maintain that starved state is like 100%. Especially if you've got a purge in your back pocket. You see how that combined together? There's like three, four things. It's not 20. It's only really just like gratification of the thinnerness, gratification of the starvingness aspect of it. In your mind, the mental concept of I don't need to eat very much. You You liked it. There was gratification you got out of that. It's like a secret lovingness around that sense of Yes. <laughs> so worked, right? That just means that you've still believed in thin supremacy. You still yeah. believe in it, right? Because it means that you're still holding the symbolism to it. If you didn't have the symbolism attached to it, would it have affected your brain? No. Because you would have been like, I just can't wait to eat. I can't wait to feel normal again. Oh, I want my so, energy I back. I, I just enjoy my food again. Yeah. The, nice you yeah. would have been like, screw the weight loss. Who cares? I just want yeah, to feel energized again. Meal. Yeah. But because um, you believed in that, that attachment to success within yourself and betterment. Yeah, really about it, but that happened, but yeah. yeah. Yeah, you attached power to it or controllingness or whatever yeah. was that that you know, if you believe that, you're gonna be very sensitive to that response, to that condition. So it's a condition, it's like a it's like an environmental condition that you've attached and associated that grandeur to. And so the brain doesn't know that it's not, it's just a, your brain thinks, oh, this is a safe place. We want her to be here because you believe it's safe, right? For whatever reason. In reality, is it really that safe? Look at what happened in your own behavior. Yeah. It's um, super dangerous got really sick again. Super dangerous. Look at what happened to the body. So the brain is like, oh, this must be a safe place. What happens in reality when you're in that place? Pretty abusive, right? The binging, the purging, the binging, the purging. Think about how dangerous that is to the actual body. Yeah. Wouldn't it be cool if the body could give you those warning signs with... (laughs) You know, but it doesn't. It believes your perceptions and it responds to perception. It doesn't respond to the reality that, oh, when she's here, my whole body gets tortured and damaged. (laughs) Yeah. I know. So you have to look at 
the belief pattern that is actually promoting the whole thing. So this whole thing, the cornerstone, if you want to see it as a bridge of sorts that can only be held up by a cornerstone, we can look at this and say, of course, every piece to that is important, but the cornerstone is the actual belief in the symbolism around safety and happiness in life and freedom attached to thinness. And, and it can be anything. It doesn't have to be just thinness. It's anything that is outside of yourself. And I say self from the from the non-ego concept of yourself, the real, from, from the child from within, if you want to call it that, the truth of your reality, right? There's, a, there's um, the ego self, which is who I am and the concept of me, the concept of my success, what makes me different than other people. It's like, it's like the concept of you that has a PhD and has a, is super smart and who really knows what to do and super organized and look at me, I'm perfect. That concept of yourself, right? That's the ego, the super ego. Versus the sense of being within you that is aware that you are here and witnessing life. There is that me and then there's the ego me. Know the difference, right? Yeah. yeah. So my point was, you've attached happiness to the ego me and the conditions you think you are. Yes. Such as, I am thin. The very first time I spoke to you took me to the beach in my mind. And I really got in contact with that real me. Because mm -hmm. I was just sat there wearing, wearing 300 pounds and just... Enjoying the beach. <laughs> Enjoying the beach. Yeah, the, the, the real you would have just disappeared into the environment and been a part of it. Yeah. The ego you is the concept of you that's in your mind. It's a mental concept. It's not a heart feel concept. It's a mental concept of yourself that you envision. And it's typically in the center of the beach with the beach revolving around it. <laughs> That's, yeah. that's this concept that I will survive with my, the concept of me versus my survival is hardwired into nature and existing. Uh, it's so hard to describe because it sounds so like... I, I do get it. I do know what you mean. Yeah. Yeah, and so, me. yeah so when you just accept the experience as it is, as a witness me, the witness me, what happens to your need to control the environment? Yeah, it just floats away. Oh, yeah, yeah. and you just get to exist and be present. Yeah. And there's no strain, no stress. There is just minimal, very minimal needs. When you're hungry, find something to get rid of that hunger and to enjoy. And then what happens after that? There's way more. It's super expansive. So the actual um, at food becomes a pleasure that is not necessarily all that important. It's important when it's important, but it's not. You know, it becomes something that's just part of this huge landscape and experience. Um, it's just so dimension, so multidimensional, right? So when you go into the conditional concept of me that is constructed with a lot of programming, right, around who our culture is, where you live, what's your history, what's your genetics, all those things that create a con concept of yourself. The ego me, the super ego me, right? Those <laughs> require conditions meet. You, you have to meet certain conditions to feel adequate, to feel that you can. Ex the, the illusion of that super ego is when you meet these conditions, you get the freedom of the, the all me, right? Yeah. And it doesn't yeah. work that way. That's a, that's a, you're chasing the fantasy of, uh, yeah. right? Lots of illusion comes in. Yeah. Totally. Well, the end result, I would say, is somewhat the same. You're still seeking happiness, freedom, um, but one is very much self-centered focused, and the other one is allness focused or non. -focused. I get it. 
yeah. Yeah. And so what that allness includes is any condition of the body. And that's something I became aware of too. Like, okay, you know, in my desperate plea to not commit suicide in the moments I was preparing to commit suicide, I remember opening myself up to the potential that when I die, I might re- I might get another chance. That was what I was hoping. I was like, if if there is a God, if there is a creator, if there is something out there, I really do want another chance. I don't want this to be my end permanently. But so it really forced me to question my belief about death and life and what's going on. But because you're facing the reality of killing your, your life, the one the body is giving you. And I remember thinking, if I reincarnate, I'm going to get another body. How do I want to relate to that one? Because this one has been very toxic. Not the body, my relationship to it. Yeah, it's not the body that's been toxic. It's the way I've held it to a standard. So the standard is actually quite toxic, not the body I was in. My body has always been beautiful, magical. And it's not beauty, you know. So I had to really question what... What is the role of the body in if I die, if I if I end this life because it's so horrible and I get another opportunity, I have to rethink how I want to relate to the next body. And I remember thinking, I just don't want to care because if I care about it that much, I won't get any freedom. It's just going to be like I just went from one hell to another hell. That's powerful. Because it's true. <laughs> That reminds me, on the top last time, yeah, it's true. you got a new body holding it to the same standards. That, that's something that came up when we talked in the last session when I said I didn't want to listen back to our session because I felt self-conscious. And yeah, that was like our third or fourth. Was, I was holding myself to a ridiculous standard that was fantasy. That just yeah, that perpetuates this misery. Yeah. Yeah. So I had to, for me, I had to go into um, the vulnerability of not just a body that could be fat. Because my first reaction, I recall very quickly responding with, well, I'd have to fix it first. And I went, hold on. (laughs) I I can't do that. I can't do it. I realized that right there. I I just, I can't do this again. I don't want to do this again. So I have to be willfully vulnerable. It's a very vulnerable position to be in. With whatever the state of the body is that I get, if I don't accept what it is, the truth of what it is, this is all going to repeat again. So the issue I'm dealing with in the moment is the truth of the body I'm in today. It's 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 like I'm going to do the problem with my next life is is I will repeat this problem again if I am not willing to accept the truth of the body that I that is providing me life and consciousness so I remember going into that thought going oh I just want to accept what it is so if I'm fat if I'm short if I have no fingers if I have an ailment if I'm quadriplegic if I'm a paraplegic if I have a shorter life you know what I just want to accept what it is so that while I'm experiencing that life My consciousness is free to go outward, not stay inward like a cage. Did you just connect with what I just said? I did, yeah. Because what you've been experiencing is kind of like cannibalism. You're you're eating within yourself. You're eating your life up inside of itself. You're killing yourself because you're not actually living a free life. You're stuck inside going inward versus going outward right your your focus is on yourself and on your conditions and on what you have to manage and that's not freedom the it's so hard work it's so oh hard. it's in so much work it's that's something to be in awe of to be honest with you be in awe of that like wow that's a lot of work and dedication and obsession and intellect that you're capable of. So that's an amazing thing to really just observe and not be so, don't be critical of what you've been doing as much as you've been trying to do. You've been trying to reach this freedom <laughs> that goes outward by going inward that much. Like crazy. <laughs> right? Just imagine how easy it's going to be when you stop and you just allow things to go outward, right? Just. It's all there. You don't have to do anything. (laughs) 
So the only way to do that, at least at this point for you, is to accept the truth of the body. The truth of when it's going to die, when your life will be released from this, this lifetime. You accept the true vulnerability of life because it is vulnerable. How are you going to get the freedom of life if you're not willing to accept the vulnerability that is inherent to yeah. it? You're going to yeah. die. And it could be a terrible death. You're, you could get hit by a car. You could get, you know, thrown off a cliff. You could get a horrible disease and die all by yourself in a hospital. Just think of all the potential ways that this body is going to exit or to, to actually go back to feeding the earth and the life cycle that we're part of. At some point, you're going to separate from this body and the life that it gave you, the conscious life it gave you. And you're going to go, wow, what did I do? What did I, what did I just experience? Well, you know what you experienced is an obsess, an obsession of trying to change it. You've never yeah. fully just accepted your, the body for whatever it is that has nothing to do with you. Nothing to do with you. Think about what is the body you're in have, what did you do? Like, yeah. Uh, yeah, your heartbeat like, punch around in the lymphatic system. Yeah, your hair grows. <laughs> grows. Yeah. yeah. Your eyesight is working. Yeah. You have done absolutely nothing. So go into what it is you are experiencing. What is it that you are truly experiencing? What is this? What is life? What is this? You've never really thought about it, have you? You know? The beach is such a great example of just experiencing a clip of that, right? But imagine if that goes where with you everywhere you are, in your office, in your home, in your car, right? Just go into that experience. Imagine that you have died and, and God says, would you like to experience someone else's life in the moment? Wouldn't you be like, yeah, that'd be cool. I can just be in their space, be in the space of their car, be in, and be like wonderment. It's just wonderment. <laughs> Why do we got to sit here and be like, well, the body, the person's in is too fat, and I don't like its skin color, and I think it needs to be, like, a little taller, and maybe we need to change the bone structure. <laughs> That's so ridiculous. Right? You realize what it took for the body to have that bone structure. It took millennia of evolution and environmental adaptation that your opinion isn't going to change. <laughs> that just shows how crazy it is. Super ego. Yeah. It's called narcissism. It's called survival mode, believing that the body you're in is your biggest threat to life. The body that is giving you consciousness and awareness in life, you have been told, if it is not thin enough, is your biggest threat. Yeah. Body that's giving me awareness, consciousness, reception of the environment. Whether I, if you were blind, you're still getting it auditorily. If you're not getting it auditorily, you're getting it visually. You're think of all the ways that we can actually connect to this planet and other animals, and the scents and smells and the temperatures and the sun touching our skin and the experience of the universe from this planet's vantage point. The body you're in is actually giving you an experience of that. <laughs> just saying and it's taken millennia of evolution and evolving and adapting to the environment of the earth and the universe and what's been going on with it for you to be here today and we're going to sit here and have the ego enough to play God to say this is not good enough right now <laughs> yeah. right so I'm not going to go to the beach I'm going to focus on what I need to do to Stay thin and to be thin because thinness is the universe. <laughs> but that's what it feels like. Yeah. I know. It sounds like what? <laughs> there was a TV show on yesterday and they did a poll to say, have you ever avoided going out 
to an occasion because the, you don't like the way you look. 74% of the respondents said they hadn't gone to a wedding or a family mm -hmm. event or to a holiday or a night out because they didn't like the way they looked. Yeah, they're embarrassed um, because they, they are identifying by whatever look is seen as popular or or is seen as um, acceptable. That is my friend. That my friend. Well, let's just open our mind around what that might be. Because I, it's it is sad to be stuck in that animal state of mind, but it serves the animal aspect of survival. Can you see why? Why do you think? Statistically, you would say that's that is very significant that's crazy significant right looking at it from a research point of view what do you think that's an indication of then i mean that's massive right and then the other 25 percent are probably forgetting those moments when they didn't go out. okay <laughs> um the social scientists would look at that and go well yeah that's evolutionary psychology our wiring is to want to blend into the background because if we are to stand out we're we're wired to think we're going to be a target for criticism to be seen as different so there is a small percentage that wants that difference because they think it makes them superior okay but the rest of the majority, we want to blend into the background. So that is a wired response to our fighter, you know, our need to survive, right? There is a reason why, so for example, you and I are, we might look at some fashion trends and we might not be on the front end or the way back end of it. Like you can look at that upside down U curve that is with like, Technology, for example, there's the front end of the curve who spends way more money than they need to trying to be at the top of the. And then there's the people who wait until <laughs> until they're so far out of reality to actually get a cell phone. Right. The majority of us are in the center because we're adapting to our environment. The adaptation effect ultimately is the willfulness to mingle in your 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 environment. So if you were to travel the world, there's some part of you that is going to want to dress and act and eat as the culture you're going to be in. So it is sad, but it's really not. The sad part about it is the fact that they think they're unworthy of being social if they don't blend in. So there's a personal aspect where they're identifying their value that is impacting their willfulness to go out, right? Yeah, yeah, that's a bit that's sad. Yeah, agreed. Don't feel good enough. Yeah, totally, right? Yeah. And that might come from the fact that they, for whatever reason, they take pride in their thinnerness or the betterness of their looks. And right now, maybe they had children and they don't feel good about that. And they starting, they have a body that looks like they had a baby, and they don't want people to know that they're normal. You know, those um, expectations that are put out there by the radical extremes of those belief systems, right? Again, that upside down U curve, the front end of the curve, those are the people that are saying you should be better than this. After I spent last time, I felt a bit, I don't know, I was discompopulated about the narcissism thing. <laughs> Well, you finally saw it, which was amazing. You're oh, like, oh, oh my God. God, that's hard to get people to see without I hurting their feelings, you know, without them taking it personal. I went online and I did a, a narcissism personality test. <laughs> this is hilarious. I scored really high. I'm quite proud. I'm quite narcissistic about this. I scored I love it. Um, hopefully you were answering the questions from your belief patterns from before, and that would be... I scored really high on exhibitionism and superiority. I love it. You see, you were on that front curve holding yourself to those radical standards, and then in reality feeling con the, the intense shame about it. That's the downside of that type of narcissism. Again, remember when, I just think it's so important that when we talk about it, 
that we're not criticizing this, this. We're not criticizing that narcissism because it serves a purpose. You could look at it and go, look at how much I've been able to accomplish with it. Yeah. The problem is that is should people live in that and, and should that be what really drives people? Especially when it comes with this type of consequence, right? This type of promoted me mental yeah. health problem. Because on paper it looks good. Yeah. yeah. But the reality of it is that it has come at a very high cost to you psychologically, socially, and emotionally. Yeah. You know? Because I, I have been very isolated of like, yeah, I live on my own. I don't keep myself to myself. I don't. Yeah, you don't open yourself up to vulnerability because you can't no. control it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and that's, that's like a very specific, remember when I was like, it's not this causes that so much as it is this is what promotes that. So when, it, when, it, when you're looking at survival um, and, and your way of trying to survive, you believed or you attached to that idea that you will feel, you will come out of survival mode, you'll be happy and free when people admire you. Illusion, yeah. You've yeah. attached it to ad admiration. You're screwed, right? <laughs> yeah. And those are the wor sometimes those are you know I wouldn't describe you as well, and I've never worked with you. I've never you know other people who may have worked with you who you saw as competition. I don't know. I don't know how it manifested and what you honed it into, but. You're either way, there's been disconnection, lack of heart, um, lack of love, lack of freedom, lack of truth, lack, lack of exploration because you're trying to fit your self concept into a superior quality, which requires you are a slave to what that right. takes. So yes. you don't get freedom. You don't connect with other people because you're so connected almost. You lose touch with, with, with your reality and you become very in touch with your concept of yourself or the concept of reality, right? And so when we get rid of this concept of reality, what do you think it feels like to people who have that? And then you get rid of it. Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> Well, you should you're, you should be some to, to some degree feeling that. I can tell you how it felt for me. Like, just like, oh. It feels like nothingness. So the well, there's relief, but there, but then there comes this space of like, I don't even know what's out there. So you're with there's a zero to it. It feels like nothing. Um, Dr. Hawkins, who I study, would say it feels like it's a void. There is a space of nothing. Because without this concept of yourself, you're very uh, made aware of how hollow your sense of yourself has been. Like there is no concept of yourself. It is, there's nothing there. Everything has been mentally constructed. The fantasies, the concepts, the lines, the the, you know, this or that, this construction has been your entire focus in life. So to remove it all, it's almost like rebirth. It's like, I'm a child, I'm a baby, I'm, there's nothing here, I don't even have anything. So if you're afraid of that, that's where a lot of people relapse, right? Because without what I know, I know nothing. You following me right now, or is this just sound like gibberish? No, it doesn't sound like gibberish. It's just hard to, I guess, unless you're experienced, then it's hard to well, imagine. I'm, it is. So what I'm trying to get you prepared for is that. Yeah, yeah. Because to some degree, you know, you've done a little bit, but not really. You know, you're yeah, still hold, you I still held that. on to this concept. Yeah, and so this is going to get intense. So where we're going now is actually surrendering your entire self concept. I, th I really think I don't know. I hope I think I hope I am ready because when you were talking just now, I was thinking, 
so harsh, so harsh and unforgiving. And I know you talk about grace, and there's no grace in that whatsoever. No, in the way you've been, no, because it's so um, it's so constructed mentally. It's a mental yeah. construct. It's like a concept. It's not real. There's no reality in it. Again, look at the reality of life yeah, and the yeah. universe and the truth of leaves and trees and grass and air and yeah. the weather patterns. There's nothing linear about it other than our perception, right? Because yeah. the human yeah. mind works in sequential order. That's how our minds work. So we're so full of ourselves that we think everything works that way. <laughs> so full of myself. Right? Right. The human perception is how the entire universe works. We're like a parasite, okay? <laughs> and we think how we perceive the world is how it exists. So imagine that you become aware of that, of that within yourself, right? Just imagine you become aware that your perception is one of infinite. I might feel a bit giddy. <laughs> All of a sudden, you're like, oh shit. Uh, I'm sitting here playing God, and I'm, and I am in one sense of one aspect from one filtered viewpoint that only sees in sequences, that only perceives sequential order, right? Um, I was talking to my father in law about the concept of time. He's been taking this uh, physics course and I'm like well yeah time space this whole thing is super fascinating but time don't you agree to some to some extent is a human perception so we're perceiving this in sequential order does the universe occur in sequential order and he looked at me like I was freaking crazy <laughs> I was I, you know it's something to it's relativity Einstein was so on it Super relative, super relative, right? So the point being, when you get rid of this concept of this concept of who you are, it becomes like, who, oh, I'm all of it. I have infinite potential, and everything I've done up until this point is a manifestation of my humanness under survival constraints. So what happens when you come out of human survival constraints is all of a sudden it's infinite. It's not we have to survive. It's surviving is occurring spontaneously. Oh, this is, you are capable of thinking. I know you are. Your intellect is capable of this. It's just a matter of you getting, wanting what I'm describing. Yeah, and being open to it because it's, there's, yeah. there's no control to it. It's really foreign when everything has been so controlling, yeah. so controlling. So Right, so when you get rid of the controllingness and you're removed from that role, what is it going to feel like? Besides relieving, besides relieving, what yeah, is that? the thing that comes to mind immediately. I know, you're like, it would be amazing. Besides that, where it, what does it feel like? Like, just think of space, your environment. So if you... It's like, we're hanging space. There, it's going to feel vulnerable. You're going to feel like infinity. Like, I get that. Yeah, because I, I, I get anxiety with it as well. That's what yeah. I'm trying to talk to you about, is what happens when people feel that I don't, I'm not going to know what to do. What is that anxiety? Where is it coming from? It's like having an empty map. Yeah, like feeling lost. Fear of what? Because anxiety is fear. Oh, God. And losing that self that I constructed. Well, myself. so what is that constructed self? What does that symbolize then? Because it's not the concept of the self. It's what it symbolizes, right? What do you get out of that concept of yourself? What is, what is it that you're getting from it? What do you, what's the illusion that you get from it? Direction, control. 
Yeah. So if so if that's gone and there is this infinite space of potential, what what would bring up anxiety in that moment? I had anxiety. It was like <gasps> I know what was going on back here. So if I make this shift, it was almost like infinite vulnerability to go where I've never been before. My question that arose within me is, how am I going to know what to do? Does that make sense? Are you coordinating with that? Yes. Do you get that same feeling? What am I going to do? Just, just let all those defenses just drop. And what then is going to direct you? So do you see what I mean by before my direction was mentally constructed? This is what I'm supposed to do. This is what I'm supposed to be. This is how hard I have to work. It was all constructed for you. Brain. It was more than that. It was this is what I have to be. Yes. And that was constructed and for I you. I cannot be anything else. I have to be that. Yeah. And so that is gone. And what exists out there? Everything. Everything exists, not just one thing, everything. So what is the truth then? Because you could say what I have to be, that's your survival language speaking. Is there, a, wouldn't you agree it's fake? It's a lie. It's a concept. Yeah. And, a, and a radicalized one at that. There's no, there's no shape in it. There's no realness, there's no truth, it's just full of horrible torture. Fear. Totally, because you're because people will find out you're fake. Yeah. It's a fraud. It's not real. They'll find out, you know. So So going back to this question about going into this space of freedom. What would bring up that anxiety? It's 6.30. <laughs> I was... Do you yeah, see that? I do see that, yeah. That's what it is. So what do you have to transcend to get, go forward into that space? I'm going to give you another hint. <laughs> Video. That's the only way you're going to go over there is to know I'm okay with that because what I'm in is torture. Failure would be far better. <laughs> and with that. respect to the life that you are living in, that is horrible. Dante's Inferno of Hell in torture. Failure would be like a party because all that requires is humility to be okay with it so if you can be okay with failure in all relativity because the truth of the matter is you're a failure to everybody around you on some on some level <laughs> yeah. you know so you have to say I I'm okay with that. I, I, and the being okay, getting to the point of being okay with failure, what it requires is that you don't think that it's defining you, right? That failure isn't defining, that it's not even, um, it's, it's all relative failure. And if you're doing the best you can with what you're aware of, with your, with integrity, it's not a failure. That's relative, and you're okay with that. So you have to give it grace from within yourself. No matter what anybody's, no matter what someone else's opinion is, because the truth of the matter is they're right. Relative to their one way of thinking and their programming, you aren't good enough. Are you okay with that? It's softening. When it, it gives you freedom. 
the very the last time before I went away, <laughs> I've come back now because of the binging purging started again. I am. Um, I did have. I have softened a little bit since then. I'm, I am softer. I'm less judgmental of other people. I am softer around other people, but I haven't given myself any of that mm -hmm. kindness. And maybe that's where we're at now, is it's time to do it for yourself. Yeah. To actually yeah. give yourself, you know what, what does it feel, what does it feel like to actually fail? Let's just go there, because that ultimately is what you're afraid of, failure, and what it yeah. symbolizes, right? Felt it. What does it symbolize to you? Don't you agree that's what underlies this whole thing is you feel like a freaking failure to everything? Can I can I tell you something about my childhood? Sure. Um, my parents were in a top security mental hospital and we lived in the grounds. My parents aren't too well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I love them dearly, but they're not really... Um, well, I suppose nobody's really well, but and it was very, very difficult because the, the, well, the pot calling the kettle black there, if you know what I mean. Uh, I do. <laughs> uh, uh, no, alcoholic. My mum really neurotic and prone to getting hysterical. Yeah. And we lived in this the grounds of the top security mental hospital. A house, the worst murderers and serial killers in the country, and. I was constantly, I don't know if it's constant, but I was told that I was, oh, it was so horrible. I was worse than them who were locked up in there, and I was a psychopath, and when I grew up, that's where I was going to end up, and I think it really... Oh, see, this is where your desire to prove them wrong and to succeed is probably, that's where this superiority the need to be praised, that makes so much sense. That makes, that is like, of course. Oh my God. So forgivable. Don't you agree this, your desire to be seen as, go back to our last session where you were like, I just want to be praised. I want to feel that I have, it's like proving them wrong. Can you see where this narcissism specific to the desire to be praised why why as a child when you were told that and you believed it and you wanted to prove them wrong why your standards for yourself became so radicalized i was terrified yeah, and would you say, too, that it was really stigmatizing for those people in that mental hospital to really judge them as inferior and bad and wrong? No compassion in any way for those people. It was horrible, Robbie, because yeah. my parents had talked to each other about at work. I'd hear these conversations about, oh, yeah, do you know what he did? He cut his... I was a child, it cut his roommate's head off and put it in a pot and boiled it and shoved the torso of his body. And these are the things I'd be hearing in mm -hmm. conversation at home. And then my mum and dad would say, You're worse. <laughs> You're worse than <laughs> Oh, God, it was just. Yeah, and you know what? They must have thought for some reason that that was going to want, that was going to somehow <laughs> encourage you to listen to what they were saying and to stop being the way you were and they were trying to get you to just do what they wanted you to do and be the way they wanted you to be and so them saying that was their way of maybe trying to get you to uh, to do what they wanted you to do and be the way they wanted you to be you know that blew up in their face <laughs> right <laughs> They were reaching. For some reason, they probably thought you were just a little devil child that was had a mind of her own. We needed to tame the shrew. Yeah. 
for whatever reason, and in your mind, you had to prove them wrong. And don't you agree? That seems a little, it, that's radical. And that story, you got to question the truth of what they were telling you. Really? How common is that? That someone does that? I mean, we're talking like psychopath crazy. I mean, how many... Of course, it does exist. Look at Jeffrey Dahmer. You know who that is? No. That's a person in the United States that actually had a Jeffrey Dahmer. I'm pretty sure I got the right one. He was like a he was gay and he pre, he preyed on gay boys and men and he did kill them, dismember them, and eat their bodies. That is so radically not That's common, <laughs> right? I mean, he he's well known in the United States because of that. I mean, it's like. Though the infamous crazy people that are recognized nationally, right? Anyway, so I wonder how much of what they told you was just fear. They were trying to get you to, you know, be afraid of some for some reason. I don't know, but it's it is. You've got to be able to for, number one forgive your parents for not knowing really how to parent. They had no clue and not really understanding the consequences of that fear mongering and. And how it impacted your self-concept. Do you really think they understood all that? No. And I, I get that now. <laughs> yeah. Now that you're getting help and we're talking about all this big stuff, now you can go back and go, oh, they didn't know what they were doing. That's driving. If I could just get this, that would fix everything. That, if I could just get this fantastic job, that would just be enough. <laughs> then it will be better. I'll just make everything all right. I'll prove myself. So what would happen then if you just said, you know what? Maybe they're right. Maybe I am a failure. Maybe I am crazy. <sighs> Think about that for a second. What if you are? What if it's true? You're doing the best you can with what you're aware of. You've done the best you can, and you've really tried hard. And the truth of the matter is, what if you are Looney Tune Mental Hospital quality person? Doing the best you can. What if it's true? Should you feel well, bad? Feel Sorry? Should you feel bad about yourself? It doesn't matter. What if that's huh? true? So you notice how I'm not going to negotiate with that. Let's go to that truth as if it's true. Because relative to what if you are in fact a terrible human being? Yeah. You're doing the best you can, right? Yeah. Can't do any better than this, <laughs> right? Right. <laughs> right. Absolutely. So what if it's true? Is this unforgivable? Is it? Does it really mean you're a horrible person that has no worth as a human being? Is it really worthy of shame? I know you are because this is going the opposite direction. This is the direction you need to go. You need to question the belief that those people in that mental hospital yeah, were, were, were bad people. Were they really? My, my stomach's in knots. There, was, there no, was there no relative like Compassion. stories behind how and what happened to them and what their experiences were and how hard they tried to get better and what they did and how they coped? Was there no, is there no respect for human uh, humanity here in our human nature under extreme assault, right? It's the hard story. Yeah, you're not getting that context of the people that your parents were shaming. 
and telling yeah. you you're going to be like them, like they're worthy of their scum of the earth. That right there is narcissism. Narcissists would look at those people and tell you they are the scum of the earth. Yeah. Right? And so you're afraid to be the scum of the earth. What if you are? I am. You get my point now? What if you are calling the kettle black here? What if you are? And everything you've done, you've worked your tail off, and you're you're you've been checked into a mental hospital before. What if you are one of them? Should you feel horrible about it? Still, a human being. You are. You are. And does that not? Do you not deserve compassion for how this has happened and what you wanted to prove and how your narcissism has been inflamed? And you know what I'm saying? Like, is there no story behind this situation? Yeah. Right? N notice your story came with your parents and how that makes total sense to me now. Like, well, of course you're going to compensate because you got to prove yourself. You got to make them. She's turned out to be, and I'm gonna make them feel sorry for telling me that shit. <laughs> terrible parents. Like they knew, they didn't know any different. They probably thought they were inspiring you. Whatever. Back the way people parented uh, in that generation, beat the living hell out of your child to submission. That's how you parent, you know. Generational shit. And you're recovering from that generation, and you've got to recover from how you coped with it. You know, did you? Do you really need to prove yourself to the offset a uh, murderous person that has significant mental health problems? Because that's what you're how you're treating yourself is if you're a murderous person <laughs> who needs to prove themselves otherwise. So the way you resolve this is you actually ask if that person who was, if that person doesn't, is that person really worth, worthless? Is it really worthless? No. No. Is there no compassion for what would bring another human being to break psychologically and spiritually yeah. to that degree? Yeah. Yeah, there's probably a horror story that that person experiences as a child and how they cope and compensate that has completely ripped them of their soul. And then to be treated as if they're the scum of the earth, you can imagine how that impacts their psyche. Yeah, oh, God, yeah. Mm, see what I mean? It's awful, is it? Yeah. So, to me, it sounded like a place of brutality. Um, perpetrated on the patients who are in there, like putting them in seclusion and um, yeah. sitting on them and stabbing them and with needles and, and you, electric shocking their brains. And, yeah, and you've pretty much done that to horrible. yourself. You've done that to yourself in a different way. <laughs> right? So you are living in your own little mental hospital of total, complete tor torture. <laughs> Don't you think you should be let let out that you're really yeah. <laughs> The question you have to ask yourself is, well, even if I am if if what I am doing and how I have been is scum of the earth, I'm okay with that. Cuz I can't do better than that. This was my best. And I I am a horrible human being that sucks and is worth nothing. You know what? So be it. Because if you can be okay with that, and you forgive yourself for being a failure, a loser, a failure, scum of the earth, crazy, fucked up, whatever you want to call it. If you can give it grace and you can say, you know what? I am a human being who is trying to figure my shit out. And you know what? If I am Looney Tunes, I deserve love and compassion and the grace to figure this out. 
the space, the breathing room, and a loving environment. Maybe that's what's, what you need instead of isolation, stabbing, poking, starving. Well, that'd be a challenge. <laughs> that'd be a <laughs> Right? That's something radically different. Oh, my yeah. God. You need to get out of your mental hospital. You're it, And you yeah. got to believe that you are good enough at your heart. Even if you are failing, you're a good enough person that you're not going to harm anybody. You're not here to hurt anybody. You're not really truthfully wanting to be superior than anybody either. You just want to be normal. You want to connect. You want to hang out with your classmates and just be with them rather than have to be better than them. That's what I said last time. I just wanted, to, I just wanted people to think I was normal. Well, what if you are? <laughs> If you don't have to compensate for being a murderous, torturous scum of the earth, then don't you get to just be? That'd be nice. Yeah. All right. I got to get going. Thank you.